Hello, um, I'm a professional archaeologist and heritage practitioner. And while I'm not a professional filmmaker, I have been making short digital videos about archaeology and heritage for some time. And um, at last year's conference, uh, Digital Past 2020, I gave a keynote address which looked at the ethics of some heritage virtual reality experiences. And for that, I drew on documentary film theory, literature, and close reading of visual and audio editing decisions made by the virtual reality producers based on my practical understanding of video production and editing. So I offered this paper to the conference this year to apply some documentary film theory to my own video work to expand my understanding of digital representation of archaeology and cultural heritage. Because I'm currently making a series of short videos about the archive scan project at the University of Leicester for public outreach and university teaching. The um, project is developing an image recognition and machine learning service to automatically identify and record Roman pottery. And the project is led by Penelope Allison in archaeology and ancient history and Ivan Tuchin in mathematics and funded by an Arts and Humanities Research Council grant. In early 2020, volunteers started to help the archive scan team scan large numbers of Roman pots from collections held by project partner, the Museum of London Archaeology. And I agreed to make videos about the project in my role as an honorary research fellow in, the, in archaeology at the University of Leicester, and also as an independent video maker. And this is an opportunity for me to further develop my video skills, and it also supports my other research interests. And as I've learned more about video making, I've become increasingly aware of the impact of expressive techniques on the tonal and other qualities of my videos. And digital heritage, such as 3D models, VR experiences, and other forms and formats also involve decisions about expressive techniques. Recently, Tracy Ireland from the University of Canberra sent me her paper with Tessa Bell called Facing Future Feelings, a practice-led experiment with emergent digital materialities of heritage, which is in press, and a link to a 3D model of, on Sketchfab of the ruins of the abandoned village of Asanu in the Trudos Mountains of Cyprus, which they made for their project. None of the archaeology team were experts in 3D visualization. They used consumer level software and reflected on their hands on experience to, to discuss the qualities and values of rendered forensically accurate digital facsimiles of heritage objects and places more generally and the context of their production and reception. I saw similarities with my practice-led video work and thought it would be interesting to look at different kinds of digital heritage to better understand representation, reality and audiovisual storytelling through short form video and by other means. So delivering a paper now would support me to take these ideas further. From March 2020, the pandemic stalled the archive scan project itself, and with it, all my plans to record more video at different locations with the team and volunteers and project partners elsewhere. The circumstances have also slowed my video editing. Um, the the footage I'd recorded from early 2020, because the options to do much with it are restricted by having a lot less footage to work with, and I can't collect more or redo things, and I'm having to think of other ways of moving this forward. It's important to me that my videos are made in close consultation with the archive scan team members, and I can't sensibly proceed with some of it without their input. But most people have been too busy or unavailable to, due, due to the pandemic to provide feedback on my first video cuts, so we're planning to take it forward soon. Eventually, a small group of archive scan project staff resumed some COVID safe pot scanning with the Vindolanda Trust in late 2020, but no volunteers 
were allowed and I couldn't go and film. The caption on the image says, socially distanced team members Dan and Santos enjoying lunch at Doncaster Railway Station in between transfers on their way to Vindolanda. But the project's pretty much slowed down like much else. So instead of pulling out my paper because it was, it's just not advanced enough and I've also not had enough time to do the research I wanted to do for this paper, um, I've decided to just shift the scope and aims of the paper slightly and outline some of my previous video experience to provide context for the archive scan work. And I think this is a potentially wider interest and I'd like to develop the research further. And I can't show any videos today, but a lot of my work is available online apart from archive scan because not much is up there yet. I'm still and always learning video making. And um, my earliest work was just recording information about archaeological field and laboratory work to complement photography. So a type of moving photograph with sound, which is, for example, quite good at, at showing landscapes. And this is very common um, use of archaeology in archaeology of video, um, just as part of normal practice. I then um, went on to make a series of short edited videos about archaeological methods as an extension of teaching with staff and colleagues at the University of Sydney. And this is Martin Gibbs, my ex-colleague from Sydney. Between 2017 and 2012, I worked on the Sydney Fish Project with the University of Sydney Library staff to create a sustainably archived online collection of digital photographs of fish remains, which is published in an article by Rowan Brownlee and I in 2010. This was to support research on Australian archaeology. Hundreds of standardised photographs of fish remains from physical reference collections at the Australian National University and Sydney University were taken by professional photographer Russell Workman and I worked with Russell and lined them up. So I, they were standardised and I, or I, they showed things which I know are important for diagnosing taxon, for example. And these are these were and still are made accessible via the archive at the library in ways that represent scientifically accurate visual information based on biological taxonomies. So this was about recording and presenting information using indexable digital images. Interpretation, contextualization, and aesthetics did not feature explicitly, if at all, in the project rationale. About this time, somebody suggested making 3D digital scans of bones that could be used, that users could manipulate and view them for themselves from different angles. And there are collections like this now. While novel, I thought this would only be useful to experts who already knew what they were looking at. I suppose you could annotate them, but wasn't really sensible at that time. And I wanted to capture and communicate my expertise in fishbone analysis and thought it more useful to make edited videos explaining some ideas and showing sequences of fish remains from particular angles and viewpoints. And that was also a lot cheaper and easier at that time. It might have changed now as the technology's moved on. And I started experimenting with edited digital video using content from my archive and other images and videos. Eventually, I made a short video called Fishbone, which I sh showed at the Arche Australian Archaeological Association conference in 2010 in a session on telling a story about an object. Images were cut over my brother's music, which was copyright free, with animation and special effects. There was minimal text and no other audio. And I also made use of many images which are well known of indigenous people encountered around the Sydney region by early colonial artists. And this is the first fleet art collection which is housed by London's Natural History Museum. And I also used fishbone photos from the archive and other video of local shell middens and indigenous rock carvings. The, the video, um, fishbone, was poetic in style. It told a strong visual story and was well received by the audience, but I could not publish it online or do anything else with it due to copyright and intellectual property issues. And it also involved indigenous content 
and had colonialist overtones, which some people regard as contentious. Um, so in 2012, I obtained a small grant from the Australian National University with archaeologists Sally Brockwell and others as an extension of that first try for the Shapeshifters project. And from that, I produced four short edited videos. These are a mix of styles and documentary modes, which I could now categorize according to Bill Nichols and other documentary film theorists. But at the time, I knew nothing about that. I just waded in and made a film. The project was fun, but it did stretch the limits of my video making abilities. And it also stretched my editing software and equipment. Um, it certainly needed better lighting in many cases, and in particular, audio recording, which is not something most archaeologists learn. It was significantly too much work for one person with only some occasional help with some videography on, and on top of a full time academic job. I was also refused necessary permissions from several Australian and overseas art galleries and museums to reuse and edit digital content from their collections in my videos, despite having the funds to pay copyright and reproduction fees. The National Library of Australia and the New South Wales State Library finally helped me, but this then required major changes to the video and extra work, and I've always been disappointed results. Um, a project which I thought was much more successful was in 2010 when Sydney-based consulting archaeologist Dennis Gojak hired me to help him process, edit and archive video he'd taken over several months of his Kentwell Cottage Heritage Conservation Project. Road widening in Western Sydney threatened this significant early 19th century wooden building. And Gojap's company was contracted by the Road and Traffic Authority to document and carefully dismantle the building for removal to storage. Gojap and his team used a handheld handycam to take many hours of video at all stages of the work, filmed over several months, which included also interviews with community members and project experts, and also Bojack explaining the project and its importance, visitors, and also in clearly articulated voiceovers. Despite some poor audio, partly resolved with subtitles and shaky handheld camera shots sometimes, the final results were good. The video has an authentic feel and shows a lot of detail of the building and the conservation work. I produced a likely edited video archive with metadata and a, and a closely edited short overview narrative short film, which I showed at an archaeology film festival at Flinders University in Adelaide in 2012. The main problem with this project was not the video, but the archiving. I stored over seven hours of edited clips in MP4 format and metadata on DVDs lodged with Gojax Heritage Company and a government heritage agency. At that time, and maybe still, I don't know, there was no option or funding to sustainably archive the video footage with a digital repository service in Australia. The work may be lost, which is a shame. My short video is still accessible on an old YouTube channel and on my personal computers, but that is not sustainable arch archiving. I moved to the UK in 2012 and I've continued making video, mainly outside archaeology. And with insight and further um, study, I can now see that I was trying to make short form linear edited videos about archaeology and heritage that tell stories and provide context that are authored and have a voice and ideally have scholarly and research merit. I am also interested in communicating archaeology and heritage to audiences through video that could be experimental, different styles and tones and modes and avoid too many cliches common in standard reality television content, which is produced in a very different context and for different reasons. And my background and understanding of archaeology and heritage is essential to this process, and I want to work collaboratively with colleagues and community members. So 
Um, with the Archive Scan project to date, I've produced a video of short interviews with 12 volunteers who were helping to scan pox at the Museum of London Archaeology in January 2020. And this was very easy, as most people are now good at performing to the camera to introduce themselves. And the location and the background shots and the personality of the people in the film make it lively. Another video I made um, with Dan Van Helden, who's the postdoc research on the project, it was explaining how to operate the project's customized mobile phone app to scan pottery, which we shot in the lab at the University of Leicester. It was very helpful to have Dan setting up the space and the archive scan equipment in advance. And we decided together which shots would be most, most helpful. And he also helped me move tripods and cameras, which is also very helpful. The video is not publicly accessible at the moment for intellectual property reasons. I'm now starting to create a series of narratives and lecture films introducing and explaining the background and aims of the project using the video I have supplemented by stills. The footage is fairly unstructured and exploratory, arising from conversation and unscripted interviews with staff and project participants. It's also not a fieldwork based project and the ideas are quite theoretical and abstract. And this makes it potentially more interesting but challenging. Given the technical nature of the content, I've added subtitles at the moment to aid editing as well um, as a sort of transcript of what people were saying. And it helps with clarity and it also compensates again for some substandard audio recording. I obviously would love to have an audio um, help with audio recording. I've been experimenting with cutting sequences and um, with different types of transitions in parts of the video and adding music sometimes, um, changing image size and shape, color correcting, and also in some cases making text and intertitles to summarize key points in my own words to move the story forward to replace some, some very overly long and complicated and bit off point academic explanations. Um, so I'm starting to voice some of the story there. This is a challenge as well, because what works well in a postgraduate research seminar does not always work well in a video, though some of the video could be used at that level to give in-depth discussion, which is really interesting. And it obviously depends on the intended audience. As a research archaeologist myself, I'm acutely aware of not dumbing down too much and misrepresenting other people's work. For this, I need feedback on my edited clips from project participants. And this is a much bigger ask than asking busy researchers to read comment on a written text. Ideally, the video should be viewed in re real time. And so far, even with very limited amounts of footage, I have over an hour of roughly edited clips, which I want people to look at. And some people have looked at them and we will get on with it, but it's just a different process. To, to, to writing, which probably most of us are more used to if we're academics or workers um, writing reports and things. An uh, sorry, video is a potentially intrusive medium. And as a video maker, and particularly when I'm an editor, I have significant responsibility for the way my video represents my research colleagues and their work. The choices I make, the expressive techniques I use, the way I tell the story are important to me and to them. Representing people presents different challenges from representing objects and places without people or things which are just very descriptive. Um, and I could discuss examples of ethical, professional and creative issues arising already from the, the videos, but their significance is not yet clear to me and my project is not sufficiently advanced. I'm now looking at ways to move my editing forward given the pandemic and restrictions and adding more content using still some of it um, available through previous work we published on internet archaeology about an earlier project which I was in, directly involved in as an archaeologist and helping run the project. I'm using animation and I would like to record new online video interviews with project participants over Zoom or similar software. So my work is not just about making edited videos and 
improving my skills, so that's my motivation on one level. The wider aim is to draw on my experience of practice to understand broader issues about how we represent facts, reality and arguments about heritage and archaeology using digital technologies of different kinds. Our understanding and experiences of heritage and history rendered digitally are also influenced by the context of production and reception, as well as the technologies themselves, of which digital video is one example. Thank you very much.